Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the latest Turtle webinar. This is Mind Reading for Marketers, how to use data to inform your content. My name is Kate, and I'm the Demand Marketing Manager here at Turtle. And I'm here with Danny, who's one of my very favorite humans. She's our content strategist, and she is a very innovative, data-driven content strategist. Here at Turtle, she heads up um, global strategy and is also the editor of The Splash, which is our quarterly digital magazine for brand marketing and communications professionals. So if you haven't received a copy of that yet, just wait, you'll get one after this. Um, so yeah, and if for those of you who don't know Turtle, we are a premium content creation software. Um, we help sales and marketing teams create, publish, and track content that people want to read. So today, Danny and I will take you through a practical overview of how to use data to improve your content. We will cover barriers and challenges, the three types of data to collect, uh, the types of information to uncover with content data, how to approach operations to create a robust data ecosystem. And as promised, by the end of the webinar, you'll all be able to go and add MindReader to your LinkedIn description. So not to worry, we will explain what that means for marketers. And uh, during the webinar, if you have any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat box. Uh, we will try and take a look and answer those as we go, but otherwise we will answer those that we can get to at the end. So without further ado, over to Danny. Hi, um, thank you for the lovely introduction. Um, let's get straight into it. Okay, um, so we thought we'd start off by talking a bit about why it's worth taking a data-driven approach to content. And when we're talking about content, we don't just mean marketing collateral. We mean any kind of content piece that you might be using for your business. So sales proposals, it could be um, onboarding handbooks, um, it could be recruitment packs, any kind of major documents that um, you create for other people to read. Um, and so generally, I mean, a lot of people will be familiar with the benefits, probably just sort of uh, from general conversation. But the benefit of taking a data-driven approach is that you actually have some hard results um, and some strong indicators for um, the effectiveness of the content that you've either produced or you're about to produce. Uh, so we use data as a way of understanding the people that we're trying to reach and then creating something that is most likely going to appeal to them based off of the behavior that we see in the data. Um, and it's not just about creating better content or um, driving better ROI or anything like that. It, it has sort of impact across um, your whole selling process, mm -hmm. um, which I think is something that you'd agree with in terms of taking uh, the data that you get from how people interact with your content and, and feeding that into other areas of the business. Yeah, absolutely. I think the upside is really high here and it's a really uh, important way that marketers can uh, be seen as more strategic partners in revenue and really bring the right insights to the sales team. So, you know, from identifying new opportunities for sales to being able to take um, some feedback off the back of a content piece and say, hey, here's exactly who read your content and here's how long, what they were interested in, what exactly they dove into and want to learn more about. And they can use that to have much more informed conversations um, all the way throughout the sales funnel. So it can be a really powerful tool. Um, but today I think we want to focus on how data can give you unique insight into your audience and allow you to personalize that content, like Danny said, all the way from your kind of top of funnel uh, awareness and uh, content that they might be interested in and, and create some interest around your brand all the way down to those kind of proposals and sales pitches and things like that that are having uh, much more personalized conversations. And I think and in, in certainly in the kind of creative community, um, there's some resistance to the kind of data driven approach, partly because I think uh, one of our colleagues was saying that at Madfest, which is a big kind of advertising mm -hmm. event in London, um, people were very much talking about, is, is data killing creativity? And I really don't think that that is the case. I think you have to think about when you use data and when you experiment creatively in order to get data and mm -hmm. see what works and what doesn't. Um, but we'll talk a little bit more about that. But this isn't about not taking creative leaps with your content or experimenting in a creative way. Um, it's about thinking through how you can better understand your audience um, and how the content that you produce can help you do that. 
Yeah, um, definitely. And what, what I like, um, what, when we were talking before, what you said is like, what questions do you want to know and kind of thinking creatively about how, how you can answer those questions yeah. with content. Um, great. So today, I think um, most people are collecting data on their content and how it's performing. Um, I think there are a variety of barriers to how you take that data and do something with it. Um, we did a research study, which some of you may have heard of, with Forrester um, towards the end of last year. And there were quite clear results around the difficulties people are facing with taking the insights that you can generate from content um, and, and doing something with those. Uh, so the very kind of overarching statistic that we saw is how almost all companies are, are ch face challenges when it comes to specifically insights generated from marketing created content and experiences. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason for that, there, there are a few different um, things that came across in the research. One, and I think this is a big problem, especially in larger companies, is that uh, the people who create the content aren't necessarily, and are largely not, the same people who put that comp content in front of people. Mm -hmm. So you're disconnected from the delivery and you don't get the feedback on how good it is. You don't have access to the analytics platforms that say how well it did. And you can't get that insight on performance that can help you inform how you, A, improve an existing piece of content before it gets distributed further, or to inform um, additional content that you create moving forward. And I think that is it, that is a big barrier that businesses need, need to overcome because if you don't have that sense of performance, how do you know if the content that you're creating is good or bad in terms of how your audience cares about it and reacts to it? It could be a beautifully written, beautifully designed piece of content, but if it's not relevant to the people that you're trying mm. to engage with, um, and you won't know that for sure unless it's put in front of them and they choose to actually read it. Um, yeah. then it's not really doing what you're hired to do. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, what this makes me think of immediately is just uh, how, how something like a PDF really loses so much information um, all the way from the beginning. You might be able, if you do um, have it behind a gate or something like that, to get a little bit of information on how many people are interested. But but imagine sending it on to someone in sales and they're sending it on and you have no idea how it's performing, what it's doing, um, if people are interested in it or not. And it's much harder to create like a virtuous cycle at all with the right kind of content between sales and marketing. Yeah. So it's like similar, you know, if you've got your white papers in PDF or you've got sales presentations that you're sending mm -hmm. over in PowerPoint, you don't know what's happening other than, you know, you might know someone's opened your email or downloaded yes. the document. Um, but you're not going to get that, that insight from it that you need to, to be able to take any meaningful action. Um, secondly, um, and this kind of comes a bit back to that, uh, a lot of people struggle almost half um, to structure the kind of data and insights they get properly. And, and I, th I think this is one of the points where I think I'd love to dig a bit more down into what this means uh, from a research perspective into kind of what structuring looks like in this kind of context. But I think for a lot of people, you might be inundated with data and insights. And un unless you have some kind of process in place by which you apply that in your production process or in how you strategize, um, it, it's not gonna have mm -hmm. much, much value. Um, and one of, I guess, the final standout uh, barriers to come out of the research is how a lot of marketers just feel that they don't have the time or the expertise to analyze insights from content. And that, I mean, A, it's no surprise that marketers are time strapped. Mm. Um, and I think the, the kind of expertise side of this is understandable as well. If you think about the volume of people who work in marketing who come from more of a Kind of arts backgrounds uh, and are here to you know if you're if you're a content creator you're probably an amazing writer and you've really got the creative side down it can be a bit daunting to have to dig around in in data yeah. to figure out anything um, for sure i mean i know like for myself and a lot of people working in marketing you do tend to wear quite a few hats particularly with all of the different uh the way that the landscape is generally evolving so quickly and um i think that data is often something that feels daunting to really tackle. And if you're resource or time strapped, then it can be 
uh, difficult to dig in, like Danny said, without those kind of structures and processes already in place. And it, yeah, and it's not just about structuring this kind of insight so that it's accessible for marketers, but so that people in other functions can benefit from it. So for instance, mm-hmm. salespeople won't want to spend ages diving into an analytics dashboard that they have to learn how to use. They just want to know has my prospect read this document and what did they find most interesting and how can I tailor my conversation to their interests yeah. off the back of, of that insight? Um, and, and so you need to think of ways in which you can easily access um, and kind of deliver that insight without yeah. it being something that requires your whole company to upskill immediately. Yeah, good point. Um, moving onwards. Okay, so... There are lots of different types of data. And when we're talking about um, the data that you can get from content, uh, it's uh, perhaps not the same as what you might get from when somebody fills in a form, for instance. So if we look into the kind of three types of data that you should be looking to collect on your prospects, customers, readers, audiences, employees, whoever you're looking to um, create engaging content for, you've got number one, profile information. And this is really the kind of stuff that you will get from form completions, the kind of stuff that you can have um, extracted automatically from LinkedIn um, profiles Mm. or other publicly available sources of of data. Uh, And this will be kind of your demographic stuff. So um, it gives you an ability to maybe categorize that person um, in a particular way. Um, but it won't really tell you anything about their motivations or their intent or any of that kind of of stuff. But it's kind of your initial data that you need to capture in your CRM or wherever it is you host um, data about about your customers. The second type of data is derived information. And this is the kind of stuff that you can infer off the back of the profile information that you have. So for instance, you will know and your sales team will know um, what your ideal kind of account or customer looks like in terms of the size of the business, where they operate, um, all of those kinds of things. And so they'll be able to look at the profile information and add in more detail around and more data points around how likely is this person or this company um, going to be to convert, how large is the deal size likely to Mm. be. And that kind of information will help you to decide how much to prioritize that account for instance do they qualify for account-based marketing all that kind of stuff so that's it's another layer of of data that you um want to be collecting to help you inform um the activities that you're going to do moving forward and then the third type of data is contextual information and this is where marketing in particular but content in general can um really be a bit of a game changer Mm. Um, so contextual information is the data that you collect uh, based on how buyers interact with your organization. Um, in particular, in this instance, we think of it in terms of how they interact with the content experiences and communications that you put in front of them. Um, so, for instance, if you have a document that has a general intro, six uh, chapters, each chapter is based on a different pain point to do with the the theme of the report. Mm -hmm. Um, If you have a reader who spends all of their time uh, reading chapters one, three, and six, you know that those are the pain points that are most relevant to them. Yeah. Um, That kind of contextual information is is what we're talking about here. Definitely. And I think that this is the kind of information that really adds so much depth onto the first two layers because um, I, I think everyone can, you know, relate as a marketer uh, when you're able to pull a list of purely demographic information, it can tell you a little bit, but at the end of the day, it's very hard to know exactly what to send those people or what type of content they'd be interested in. And um, I think companies as well can do a lot of, uh, of work on identifying the behaviors that they're really looking for. Um, so who is your ideal, uh, you know, customer or buyer from the point of demographics? Yes, but also in behaviors, like I'm looking for people who are, you know, open to change and interested in certain topics. And these are the people who I know are most likely to be interested in my product. So, yeah, it just really adds a, a lot of layers, which we'll go into a little bit further. Yeah, because the more of this kind of information you get, the clearer understanding mm-hmm. you have of that end user um, and, and what matters to them. It's, it's kind of like your taking a chisel and a hammer to a block of cement and the more data you have on the the clearer that picture is. Um, Cool. 
So we want to talk a bit about um, mind reading. Yeah, so mind reading was kind of the theme of this because it's actually a, a concept within um, psychology and social cognition. And it's basically where we try to infer what's going on in someone's mind based on uh, a lot of different factors, but without actually asking them. So it's something where we would look at their body language. We might look at their facial expressions. Um, obviously online, we're looking for different cues and signals and, and trying to interpret what they're interested in, how they're feeling, um, and what they might be like, maybe some emotional kind of inferences that we can make. As humans, we do this really naturally all the time, just in any kind of conversation. We're looking at the other person and, and understanding, putting them in a context and understanding what they might be feeling and thinking, and uh, to varying degrees of accuracy, I suppose, but that's uh, what we're always trying to do. So this is really a way to say, why is it important for marketers and how can we do this online? And I think that for marketers, our entire job is essentially to do this in some way, like we're trying to understand yeah. what people want and how to communicate that back to them in a meaningful way. And um, it's true in both B2B and B2C. And I think, you know, sometimes it does involve asking them directly. And there are ways to do that within content or within your um, interactions. But often it's a process of combining the data points that you have and your own intuition and your best practice. Um, and the better data you can get on that, and particularly a lot of this, you know, behavioral contextual data, it will be so much more relevant. Um, I think as well that um, Gardner has done a lot of research around this, uh, around the buyer journey and how it's becoming much more digital. And increasingly, um, these nonverbal, I guess, digital signals are really the only signals that we will have while a potential buyer is researching us without our involvement. Um, historically, B2B was much more sales led where someone you would take them through the buying process. And now it's become an environment where the buyer really is in control and they want to do their own research, which is great. Um, and it gives marketers a huge opportunity, but we just really need to know what is relevant, what's interesting, what's the right content to be putting out there. So yeah, because that not only means that you're producing more relevant um, campaigns and content and collateral, um, it's just how you give that person a better experience mm. because even though they've done whatever the most recent statistic is around um how much of the journey is happening like online 77 percent 77 percent um when they do eventually get in touch with a human and you have that one-to-one -one interaction they don't want to be starting from the beginning in time they they mm. it, it's a better experience if you're already able to put in front of them what you know that they are interested in they don't have to explain everything to you from the start if you know that they're interested in these products present that to them first so that they don't have to wade through loads of information that isn't relevant mm. because you haven't done your homework on on them essentially yeah exactly um, and no matter what by the time uh in general not all the time but in general, by the time someone gets to a salesperson, they will have already formed a lot of opinions about your company and your product. So it's really important that we're putting the right content in front of them, basically. Yeah. Um, so following on from that um, and tying back into the kind of contextual information that we were talking about just before, um, how people interact with your content, with your communications reveals that digital body language. It's how you can understand people without them telling you directly what, what they want, who they um, what they care about um, and what's going to pique their interest. Um, and this information, this footprint um, will allow you to create really personalized nurture pathways, sales pitches, make sure that every conversation that your sales team do have is really um, targeted to the individual or the account that uh, you're engaging with. Um, and and it, it does just, as I was kind of referring to a minute ago, tie back into de delivering the best mm. experience for them. Yeah. Um, not just about helping you sell more. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think as well, going back to the Gartner research, um, one of the things they also surveyed was how difficult is it to make a buying purchase? And this is a little bit more relevant to B2B um, than B2C, which is more of a quick decision, of course, considered. But um, 
I think within B2B, a lot of buyers said that the purchase was actually really difficult. There's a lot of different stakeholders. There's a lot of um, considerations. And it's something that maybe their career or at least their reputation might hinge on a really big purchase. So anything you can do to make that easier and better for them is going to create a much better experience. Um, and the right information can really drive a purchase ease and drive high quality sales as well because they, they have increased confidence. Um, I think Gardner said the customers who got the right helpful information along the way were three times more likely to buy a bigger deal with less regret at the end of the day. So yeah, just it, it, it comes back to the customer and or the buyer or just your person, your people, whatever, and making the experience better for them yeah. easier. Um, so with that, you can use the kind of contextual information, the, the um, digital footprint to discover a variety of things about the people that um, you're looking to engage with. And I've listed some of them here and you might notice this kind of mirrors the, the sales funnel um, and each of these informs what you can learn about the next one. So for instance, you, your top of funnel content will help you to identify the things that are of greatest interest and what piques the curiosity mm -hmm. of your audience base more broadly. Um, you can then follow the, the data from there to figure out, okay, well, in these interests, which are the kind of pain points and the, the um, motivations that you're talking about that people are responding to the most? And um, then you can say, okay, well, of those pain points, what are the pro uh, products and solutions that are most relevant to mm -hmm. that? We can put those in front of them. And how much they then engage with the documents that you're sending that are around the stage of the funnel indicates how great their purchase intent is. Um, are they likely to buy anytime soon? Or do you need to keep kind of sending them things that are slightly higher up the funnel? Um, and then you kind of get towards the bottom. You maybe have your sales proposal document or um, a, a similar very kind of bottom of funnel content piece that you're sending out and you can see, okay, um, they've engaged with this document loads. Mm. They keep coming back to it. They've read it 16 times. Um, they probably are really interested in our business proposition. Yeah. Um, and there you've gone from, you know, a blog post down to a sales conversation um, yeah. and each time refining the content mm. based on how they're interacting with the previous tier or yeah. what have you. Yeah, it's, a, it's such a cool model you put together. And yeah, I think even then within the bottom of funnel content, the salesperson can very quickly see which parts of the proposition they might be sticking on and kind of dig into that a little bit and say, hey, you know, I've noticed you've been looking through this a little bit. Can I provide any more context? You know, give some yeah. additional info, whatever it is to um, help move that conversation along and whatever it takes. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, we could even run through the, the splash example in this context. No. Yeah, should we do that? Yeah, makes sense. Um, okay, bear with me while I hop out of this into another Yeah, tab. so I mentioned the splash earlier, which is our uh, quarterly digital magazine. It's really beautiful. Danny and her team put it together. And what we wanted to do is show some of the analytics behind um, the latest edition and just show like more specifically what metrics are we talking about? Um, which metrics can you actually use? Yeah, so in terms of um, evaluating content performance, uh, one of the, the things I'm really keen to encourage people to reflect on is how that content is being distributed and separating that from the performance of the content as, um, as it's received. So what I mean by that is, for instance, if you have a piece of content that has been heavily distributed by your on social media, which you don't have control over, or it's been used in countless um, email nurturing pathways and mm -hmm. things like that. A lot of eyeballs will have been brought to that piece of content. So the number of readers and the number of reads may have gone up, but where you can really evaluate uh, and learn from the content is how those readers have interacted. Um, and so things like how long have they spent reading the content? Which mm -hmm. parts of the content have they read? Which bits, did they, so in, in the structure of our format, for instance, you have kind of the, the chapter level pages and then you dive down. Um, what's that conversion rate like? Mm -hmm. um, in this instance, uh, if we're going back to, so I'll just briefly show this again, um, looking at 
the interests and curiosities. The splash is a good example of, of the kind of content that you could do. And this doesn't, we'll talk about how you do this outside of our tool as well, but it's easiest to show you um, in, in this context. Uh, a magazine has articles of lots of different topics uh, by nature. And what you can then do is see how your audience who receives this whole publication in one and can go through it and choose what they want to dive down into or not. You can see what are they most interested in. So in this, in, uh, in this particular example, we can have a look and see that, okay, so chapter three has a, a relatively high average read time compared to the second chapter. Um, the conversion rate's pretty high on uh, chapter nine. So, okay, this is about packing a personality. It's also had one of the longest kind of average read times. So this is something that, um, this article is something that people were really interested in and it, it's getting their attention and it's keeping their attention. So this is just one article. What we could do is take that article and produce a detailed guide. So in this instance, this is about how people can create a more personal tone of voice and create a personality for their mm. brand. Uh, we can take what is, I think, about an 800 word article and build that into a really practical guide for people and use that guide as the um, next stage of our motivations and pain points. Um, another example here, we've got the uh, tech accessibility as a human right article. Again, there's a nice, well, as mentioned earlier, a nice amount of engagement. You could uh, say in that instance, okay, we'll produce a thought leadership piece um, on that topic because people mm. are curious about it, they're interested in it. And we're gonna structure that um, thought leadership piece so that certain chapters of certain sections are focused on particular pain points. And then the readers of that, we can go in and see, oh, okay, so these are the particular pain points when it comes to creating accessible marketing materials that they're struggling with or creating accessible products. Um, we actually have a solution that helps you solve or overcome that challenge. That's the solution then you want to put in front of those people. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And on and on. Um, so yeah, that. and I guess just also to mention while we're in the dashboard, just the also the level of kind of real-time optimization of content because sometimes your content might not be particularly performing well but it's not because of a lack of interest you can also try to um, optimize for click-through rates you can also try to optimize for some different things within a piece of content to improve it in real time as well um and just going back into here so Obviously, that you know, we're slightly biased. It's, it's easy to do that comparison with an article, but what um, anybody can do is take this approach by taking perhaps some of your um, cheapest to produce assets. So, for instance, blog posts are relatively cheap to produce. Um, you can produce a number of them and then say, okay, I want to test how this particular audience on LinkedIn engages with um, these three blog posts, and then the blog post that is the most popular, it gets the longest average read time and the lowest bounce rate or whatever. Mm. Um, that's the one that we're gonna expand into a thought leadership report. Yeah. We're gonna do a webinar on that or whatever. Um, you just have to make sure that the conditions, so to speak, of the way that you set up that test are the same. So the where with uh, Splash, people are sent that whole document and then they can navigate through the document um, and dive down when they're ready. Um, with the blog posts, some blog posts will rank higher than others, so they'll benefit mm -hmm. from more organic traffic. Um, with uh, social media, what you can do is set up a, an A-B test where you're, you're putting it in front of the same um, sized audience, with the same interests, and can more directly compare the performance of the blogs from that particular activity. Um, and it's thinking as, as a slightly scientific way of, I mean, it's scientific, but it's, it's about thinking how you would A-B test an yeah. email, for instance, you split up the audience in two halves so that the thing that you're testing is the only variable and not the many different sources of traffic um, and then stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's a really good uh, approach as well because it saves your team time because you get to put out a lot of topics and then build on the ones that you know are really working as yeah. opposed to just sort of shooting in every direction and trying to build out a lot of different things you can kind of take like the minimum viable piece approach and you know put yeah. a lot of stuff test exactly. it out and then roll with the one that's really working um and it will also help you to get if you if you really want to do a more expensive piece of collateral it can help you get buy-in mm. for for that budget from whoever's the the purse hold, holder rather um, purse holder, purse, holder. <laughs> purse strings. 
Um, cool. Uh, yeah, let's move on to talk about how metrics are meaningless in isolation. And we've kind of touched about on this already that mm. the performance of one blog post alone isn't necessarily going to help you understand how you should be allocating your content production resource or what you should be working on next. You need to be looking at it in the context of the performance of other things, which is what we've just kind of talked about there. Mm -hmm. Set up these kinds of tests um, where you're controlling as many of the variables as possible. So the, the audience number and the audience type um, to see how different things perform. Um, but I think really just thinking about, I think we come on to this next. Um, so this is a similar point. I think I just talk too much and not push the slides. <laughs> it's all about context. It's all about context. Yeah, think about the context in which you're distributing your comp uh, content. Think about the context in which they're reading it um, and evaluate the performance data based on that. Mm. Um, and this is the kind of key, key point that I'd really love people to kind of take away from listening so patiently to us today um, is that you can build into your process and in your way of thinking about content the idea that what whatever you create needs to be teaching you something about your readers uh, it's not just about engaging them or pushing them down the funnel but actually thinking about how you can um, produce content in a way that reveals information about the interests and motivations and all of that stuff, mm. uh, which which you're not going to get from a form or from um, assessing how big a deal opportunity is, but it is nonetheless so powerful when it comes to equipping people who are going to have those more serious conversations with a better understanding of who you're talking to, mm. and are so powerful for creating personalized workflows, which, while sometimes quite complicated, is what more and more more of us are striving to do. You need that information in order to create. A, a truly personalized nurture pathway yeah. and to get it you have to be striving through every interaction to understand more about people that's where conversational marketing is kind of taking off now as yeah, well because it's yeah. about turning um things like reading a blog into more of a two-way interaction mm. to gather more information about the person that is reading it and then be able to suggest and make recommendations and put things in front of them that that are more likely to be suitable for them to help them mm. um, and be worthy of their time. Yeah, really. exactly. And I think just bringing it back to the kind of marketing, being a mind reader, like this is exactly it, right? You're, you're imagining like, what do I want to know? What am I curious about, about my audience? And then uh, working on a way to structure the content and your setup to get that answer and, and kind of inform everything you're doing. And not every piece of content is gonna be a winner. And that mm -hmm. I, I think it's important to remember that point earlier on about the fact that we're not trying to kill off creativity here. It's about experimenting, refining, experimenting, refining, um, and using every opportunity that you've got your reader's attention to learn something mm. about them. Whether it's that they have, uh, they don't know how to install, a, you know, whatever analytics thing for their, you know, if I think SEO blogs and um, digital marketing blogs have nailed the kind of content strategy around revealing pain points because mm -hmm. they can answer us a really specific queries yeah. around how do I set this up in HubSpot and things like that. Yeah. It's yeah. it's that kind of thinking that, that allows you to pinpoint um, where your prospects might need your help. Um, Definitely. And if anything, I think it enables your team to have more scope for creativity because you have the data to back it up and you can try something different and say, oh, by the way, this actually really worked. I'd like to do more of this. So it gives yeah. actually a, a, I know a lot of businesses feel the creativity is kind of getting squashed away and put into a little box. And this can be a good way to kind of push back and say, like, this is something that's really interesting uh, to our audience. And you might find that um, there's something that you've created that hasn't had the biggest reach in the world, but the people who do read it, they really read it. And you know that this is something that they really care about. And assuming you have enough information from earlier interactions about who those people are, then they could be a, just a niche part of your target audience and actually really worthy of that content time. Mm. Um, so again, it's, it's context. <laughs> um, and figuring out what you know about people based on um, what they're doing. Um, nice. 
so a lot of this is not something necessarily you can just start doing. Um, there are ways like with the A-B test that we talked about earlier that you can use the kind of technology that everybody usually has access to. But increasingly, businesses are realizing that they need to invest heavily in their data strategy in order to A, deliver the kind of customer experience that increasingly people demand, mm. but B, also structure the data that they are already collecting um, and become more data driven across the business, not just in, in content, not just in marketing. Um, and this is a, um, a big change that I think we're going to be seeing over the next decade is how much investment is going into data infrastructure. Yeah. You kind of see it already with the rise of like revenue operations managers and things like yeah. that. It's kind yeah. of, okay, we're no longer operating in these silos where sales have their data and marketing has our data and CX has their data and service or whatever. We need to find a way of, of connecting everything up. And, you know, that requires new processes, new technologies, new job roles um, and, you know, significant investment. Mm. Um, it's not going to happen overnight. Yeah. Um, we have looked into kind of the general steps that this requires, um, speaking very broadly. So the starting point, as with most things, is nailing down some kind of strategy. So bringing together people from across all these different functions I just mentioned um, and nailing down what is it that you want your data strategy to achieve? What do you want um, to be able to do with the data that you have? Um, and how do you know if you've been successful? And then figuring out, OK, well, in order to be successful, are there any holes in the data that we have? What do we have currently? It's kind of the discovery section. Are you collecting everything that you could be collecting? Um, and what technologies do you need to be um, to be getting access to? And yeah. what, what new ways of working do you need in order to um, benefit from the kinds of data that you can get from using, for instance, uh, digital first formats and things mm -hmm. like that? Um, then there's data blending or data architecture, where you need to bring all the different streams together into uh, one view ideally or it can be modeled so that you can take for instance your hubspot data and blend it with your google analytics to mm, yeah. um, see how your leads are navigating your website more clearly and things like that all, all of the there is a limitless number of integrations out there and ways of combining data and data that you can be tracking yeah um it's just you, know, you need a bit of imagination to think about what would i like to know yeah, um, exactly. Asking the right questions and um, yeah. Um, and then figuring out, okay, this is the technology we would need to be able to answer those questions quite seamlessly in mm. the day-to-day -day life and the workflows that we would need to put into place in order to do that. And, you know, it's, it's a big upfront project, but, but once you've got the, those processes designed and you've got that data ex ecosystem up and running, um, you can start just building in data-driven approach to yeah. uh, activities across the business. And it, Again, to our point earlier, it comes back to being able to provide the best experience for your customers um, based on understanding them in a non-creepy way <laughs> um, and, and delivering a more seamless experience yeah. based on their needs and their priorities and their motivations. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And I think, um, you know, some companies you might already have access to like a business intelligence or a customer data platform um, that you can actually start to play with and interrogate a little bit more and say, hey, I want to know these questions, kind of like start to build out yeah. your data ecosystem. But I think if you don't have that business wide buy in yet, you know, like Danny suggested, you can just start with what you have and start yeah. to like take what the processes and the um, systems that you do have and say, okay, what can I do? Or what can the marketing team do? Yeah. And then kind of build up to that company wide data. Ecosystem. Yeah, exactly. Cause even if you, if you don't have, you know, yeah, if you, if you don't have the budget to go crazy right mm -hmm. now, I think a lot of businesses would still benefit from just speaking to other divisions and other teams about what information about the customer would help them do their job yeah. better. So uh, in marketing, go speak to your sales guys, go ask them when you're heading into a meeting or you're putting a presentation together or whatever, mm. what would make it really like even better? Yeah. What, what do you want to know about your customers? And, you know, from, from the forester research that we did, um, it's things like, um, okay, so how responsive are they to our, to our business proposition? How interested are they in that? Yeah. Things like yeah, that. Exactly. Um, 
but you're not going to know I mean, and, and that will help you identify the questions that you want your data strategy to answer and I think that is really the, that first step yeah what do people want to know what do you want to know mm -hmm. um and and then you can kind of take it from there because some of those questions other teams can answer for you mm -hmm. um some of them you might be able to answer yourself you just haven't really thought about it and then you have a rough trajectory for where you want your da data strategy to take you yeah good stuff um so chris is asking is seo not still a vital step in connecting your data especially when there's more content available for every topic than ever before so yeah yeah okay so this is thinking about when you're kind of starting to research um just doing some seo investigation and it is one of the many data sources yeah this um and we always i think at the moment do an annual kind of uh, keyword research project mm -hmm. in order to get that data to help inform what, what people are after and i think it is that that more kind of top of funnel um in many instances although also if you're in more kind of um uh retail and things like that it would be yeah. um lower as well but um yeah no it definitely yeah. still very much part of this um i would just add though that um, at least as far as I know, maybe you know. Otherwise, um, it's a little bit harder to use that to know specifically about your own audience. And the kind of general trends might be different than kind of when it's layered on top of other data that you have about your own audience. I think it, it falls into the same bracket as third party data that you would mm. be able to get from the likes of Basumo, where you're looking up. Um, how people, what's the top shared content. It's another way of, of um, doing, especially the kind of more, the initial kind of creative stuff that's still informed by data. Yeah. Um, but not driven from specific data about your specific captured audience. So the people who are in your CRM system, yeah. the people who you know you could potentially sell to because they're the right audience. Exactly. And those are the ones that the sales teams really care when you go to them and say, hey, I know that I have something that's interesting to this audience, not just, you know, yeah. at large or in general. Um, so Joanna is saying that she loves the uh, creating content with the aim of finding out more about the audience um, and is asking for some more examples about how to do this. Ooh. So one thing that I would say is if you think about the way that you put your content together, for instance, if you have a... Um, a, a pitch deck with a lot of different uh, products in it and you put them all on the same page, you won't really know which product they're interested in. But if you structure it to where you're kind of um, putting them onto different pages, you can see exactly where someone is digging down into it. That's a very like simplified example, but just that idea of like, how do you structure it? Um, yeah, I think, I think that is, it's kind of that modular approach yeah. um, where you need to contain each individual. If it's a pain point, you're, or if the pain points you're looking to learn about or whatever, make sure mm. that you're uh, sectioning those off in the format that you're producing. Again, yeah. like if you're publishing it in PDF, you're just not going to know. Yeah, um, You do have to be thinking about the format that you're sending stuff out to. But if you're creating a microsite or doing anything where you do have tracking that allows you to break things down, mm. um, then just making sure that you separate out those different items mm -hmm. in that way. Um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I guess something around modular. And um, I think as well, it just goes back to that idea of having, so for instance, using SEO to, to get some ideas and being creative and bringing that into a test format where you're putting it in front of people with a given context. And you can see like which of these kind of maybe left field ideas is most interesting and use that to kind of uh, inform your team's creativity. If that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Um, yeah, cool. And um, if there are any other questions, we've got just a couple of minutes and feel free as well to send any follow up questions to us. We're happy to answer anything. If you, you know, rewatch and think of something you haven't asked or are curious about, I'm absolutely happy to answer more questions there, but we are just about out of time. So uh, can we have a link to the PDF? So you can have a link to the turtle doc. No PDF. <laughs> we're, uh, we're on a mission to kill the PDF, if you haven't heard. And 
<laughs> we forgive no you. No worries, no worries. It's fine. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it's, we're bringing people along with us in the mission, so we'll get you on board as well. But yeah, absolutely. We'll send a link to the turtle doc. And, you know, um, just to go back to Joanna, um, your point about how you can use how people interact with your content to learn more about your audience. I think I'm going to put together a title doc with examples of how you do just this. So That's I'll make really sure that idea. you receive that when it's ready. Um, because I realized off the cuff, I was a bit slow. <laughs> but I will get back to you with a variety of examples of how you could do this, both using awesome. our platform, but also with um, more generally available tools and what have you. Um, nice. So I'll be in touch. Cool. Yeah. Thank you so much for the great feedback and hashtag kill the PDF. Love it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for tuning in. Cool. Thanks a lot. Bye.